the Satanic Verses episode. An excerpt from The Life of Mahomet, from original sources. By Sir William Muir. 1894. Three months had hardly elapsed from the departure of the little band to Abyssinia, when, notwithstanding their secure retreat and hospitable reception at the Najish's court, the refugees again appeared in Mecca. Their return is linked with one of the strangest episodes in the life of the Prophet. Ibn Hisham contents himself with saying that they came back because tidings reached them of the conversion of the Korish. But Wakadi and Tabari narrate a story, of which the following is an outline. The aim of Mahomet had been the regeneration of his people. But he had fallen miserably short of it. The conversion of forty or fifty souls ill compensated the bitter alienation of the whole community. His heart was vexed, and his spirit chafed, by the violent opposition of the most respected and influential chiefs. The prospect was dark. To the human eye, hopeless. Sad and dispirited, the prophet longed for a reconciliation, and cast about how it could be effected. On a certain day the chief men of Mecca, gathered in a group beside the Kaaba, discussed, as was their wont, the affairs of the city. Mahomet appeared and seating himself near them in a friendly manner, began to recite in their hearing Surah 53. The chapter opens with a description of Gabriel's first visit to Mahomet, it then proceeds to unfold a second vision of that angel, at which certain heavenly mysteries were revealed. The passage is as follows. He also saw him another time, by the low tree at the furthest boundary, near to which is the paradise of rest. When the low tree covered that which it covered, his sight turned not aside, neither did it wander. And verily he beheld some of the greatest signs of his Lord. What think ye of La and Ozza, and Manat the third beside? When he had reached this verse, the devil suggested to Mahomet thoughts which had long possessed his soul, and put into his mouth words of reconciliation and compromise such as he had been yearning that God might send unto his people, namely. These are exalted females, whose intercession verily is to be sought after. The Korish were astonished and delighted at this acknowledgement of their deities, and as Mahomet wound up the surah with the closing words, wherefore bow down before God, and serve him, the whole assembly prostrated themselves with one accord on the ground and worshipped. Walid alone, unable from the infirmities of age to bow down, took a handful of earth and worshipped, pressing it to his forehead. Thus all the people were pleased at that which Mahomet had spoken, and they began to say. Now we know that it is the Lord alone that gives life and takes it away, that created and supported. And as for these our goddesses, they make intercession with him for us, wherefore, as thou hast conceded unto them a portion, we are content to follow thee. But their words disquieted Mahomet, and he retired to his house. In the evening Gabriel visited him, and the prophet, as was his wont, recited the surah to him, on which Gabriel said. What is this that thou hast done? Thou hast repeated before the people words that I never gave unto thee. So Mahomet grieved sore, and feared the Lord greatly, and he said. I have spoken of God that which he hath not said. But the Lord comforted his prophet, and restored his confidence, and cancelled the verse, and revealed the true reading thereof, as it now stands, namely. What think ye of La and Ozza, and Manat the third beside? What I shall there be male progeny unto you, and female unto him? That were indeed an unjust partition. They are naught but names, which ye and your fathers have invented. Tradition tells us that Mahomet was consoled by the following passage in Surah 22, which, however, from reference to former apostles and prophets, must have been revealed at a somewhat later period. And we have not sent before thee any apostle, nor any prophet, but when he longed, Satan cast suggestions into his longing. But God shall cancel that which Satan suggested. Then shall God establish his revelations, and God is knowing and wise, that he may make what Satan hath suggested a trial unto those whose hearts are diseased and hardened. Now when the Korish heard it, they spoke among themselves, saying, Mahomet hath repented his favourable mention of the rank of our goddesses with the Lord. He hath changed the same, and brought other words instead. So the two satanic verses were in the mouth of every one of the unbelievers, and they increased their malice, 
and stirred them up to persecute the faithful with still greater severity. Pious Muslims of after days, scandalized at the lapse of their prophet into so flagrant a concession, would reject the whole story. But the authorities are too strong to be thus summarily dismissed. It is hardly possible to conceive how the tale, if not in some shape or other founded in truth, could ever have been invented. The stubborn fact remains, and is by all admitted, that the first refugees did return about this time from Abyssinia, and that they returned in consequence of a rumor that Mecca was converted. To this fact the narrative affords the only intelligible clue. At the same time it is by no means necessary to adopt in its entirety the exculpatory version of tradition, or seek, in a supernatural interposition, the explanation of actions to be equally accounted for by the natural workings of the prophet's mind. It may be assumed that the lapse was no sudden event. It was not a concession won by surprise, or an error of the tongue committed unawares, and immediately withdrawn. The hostility of his people had long pressed upon the spirit of Mahomet, and, in his inward musings, it is admitted even by orthodox tradition, that he had been meditating the very expression which, as is alleged, the evil one prompted him to utter. Neither can we believe that the condition lasted but a day. To outward appearance the reconciliation must have been complete, and it must have continued at the least for some days, probably indeed longer, to allow of the report going forth and reaching the exiles in a shape sufficient to inspire them with confidence. We are warranted therefore in assuming a wider basis for the event than is admitted by tradition. The circumstances may be thus conceived. Up to this point Mahomet's was a spiritual religion, of which faith, and prayer, and the inculcation of virtue, formed the prominent features. Though the Kaaba and its ancient rites were held to have been founded by the patriarch Abraham, yet the worship of idols engrafted on it, and heretofore consistently rejected by Mahomet, was an integral part of the existing system. To this superstition, with all its practices, the people were obstinately wedded, and, unless permission were given to join more or less the time-honored institutions of Mecca with the true faith, there was little hope of a general conversion. How far would a strong expediency justify compromise with the prevailing system, and was it the will of God to approve it? Was not the worship of the Kaaba, after all, a divine institution? The temple was built at the command of God, the compassing of it symbolized the circling course of the heavenly bodies, and the obedience of all creation to the deity. Pious devotion was nurtured by kissing the sacred cornerstone, the slaying of sacrifices, in commemoration of Abraham's readiness to offer up his son, signified a like submission, the pilgrimage to Arafat, the sharing of the head, and other popular observances, were innocent, if not directly religious, in their tendency. But how shall he treat the idols, and the worship rendered to them? In their present mind the Korish would never abandon these. If, however, as they now professed their readiness, they would acknowledge the one true God as the supreme Lord, and look to the idols only as symbolical of the angels, what harm would result from their bare continuance? Incredible as the concession may appear, and irreconcilable with his first principles of action, Mahomet would seem to have acceded to it, and consented to maintain the heathen deities as representatives of heavenly beings whose intercession was to be hoped for with the deity. The imperfect and garbled notices of tradition give no further insight into the compromise. If Mahomet stipulated for any safeguards against the abuses of idolatry, no trace of them can be now discovered. We are only told that the arrangements, of whatever nature, gave satisfaction to the chiefs and people, and produced a temporary union. But Mahomet was not long in perceiving the inconsistency into which he had been betrayed. The people still worshipped images, and not God. No reasoning on his part, no assurance from them, could dissemble the galling fact that idolatry was as gross and prevalent as ever. His only safety now lay in disowning the concession. Satan had deceived him. The words of compromise were no part of the divine faith received from God through his heavenly messenger. The lapse was thus atoned for. The heretical verses spoken under delusion were cancelled, and others revealed in their stead, denying the existence of female angels such as Lat and Oza, and denouncing idolatry with a sentence of irrevocable condemnation. Henceforward the prophet wages mortal strife with images in every shape. His system gathers itself up into a pure and stem theism, and the Koran begins to breathe, though as yet only in the persons of Moses and Abraham, intimations of iconoclastic revenge. Ever after, the intercession of idols is scouted as futile and absurd. 
angels dare not intercede with the Almighty. How much less idols, who have no power over even the busk of a date stone, upon whom if ye call, they hear not your calling, and if they heard they would not answer you. And in the day of judgment, they shall themselves disclaim your deification of them. The following passage, produced shortly after his lapse, shows how Mahomet refuted his adversaries, and adroitly turned against them the concession of the supreme divinity of God. And if thou askest them who created the heavens and the earth, they will surely answer God. Say, what think ye then? If the Lord be pleased to visit me with affliction, can those upon whom ye call besides God, what? Could they remove the visitation? Or if he visit me with mercy, could they withhold his mercy? Say, God sufficeth for me, in him alone let those that put their trust confide. However short his fall, Mahomet retained a keen sense of its dishonor, and of the danger which lay in parleying with his adversaries. And truly they had well nigh tempted thee to swerve from what we had revealed unto thee, that thou shouldest devise concerning us a different thing, and then would they have taken thee for their friend. And if it had not been that we established thee, verily thou hadst nearly inclined unto them a little. Then verily we had caused thee to taste both the punishment of life and the punishment of death. Then thou shouldest not have found against us any helper. And now, ever and anon, the Prophet is cautioned in the Quran to beware lest he should be induced to change the words of inspiration out of a desire to deal gently with his people, or be deluded, by the pomp and numbers of the idolaters, into following after them and deserting the straight and narrow path pointed out to him by God. But although Mahomet may have completely re-established his own convictions, and regained the confidence of his adherents, there is little doubt that the concession, followed by a recantation so sudden and peremptory, seriously weakened his position with the people at large. They would not readily credit the excuse, that words of error had been cast by Satan into his mouth. Even supposing it to have been so, what faith could be placed in the revelations of a prophet liable to such influences? The divine author of a revelation must know beforehand all that he will at any subsequent period reveal. If the Quran were in truth his oracle, Mahomet would never be reduced to the petty shift of retracting as a mistake what had once been given forth as a message from heaven. And thus the Koish laughed to scorn his futile endeavor to effect a compromise which should draw them away from idolatry. They addressed him ironically in such terms as these. And when they see thee, they receive thee no otherwise than scoffingly. Ah! Is this he whom God hath sent as an apostle? Verily he had nearly seduced us from our gods, unless we had patiently persevered therein. But they shall know hereafter, when they see the torment, who a third most from the right way. To the accusations thus cast upon him, Mahomet could but oppose the reiteration of his own assurance. And when we change one verse in place of another, and God best knoweth that which he revealeth, they say. Verily thou plainly art a fabricator. Nay. But the most of them understand not. Say, the Holy Spirit hath brought it down from thy Lord in truth, to establish them that believe. We have seen that the tidings of reconciliation with the Koish induced the little band of emigrants, after residing but two months in Abyssinia, to set out on their return to Mecca. Approaching the city, they met a party of travellers who told them that Mahomet had withdrawn his concessions, and that the Koish had resumed their oppression. After consulting what should now be done, they resolved to go forward and visit their homes. If things came to the worst, they could but again escape to Abyssinia. So they entered Mecca, each under the protection of a relative or friend. The report brought by the emigrants of their kind reception by the Najashi, following upon the late events, annoyed the Koresh, and the persecution became hotter than ever. Mahomet, therefore, again recommended his followers to take refuge in Abyssinia. The first party of the new expedition set out about the sixth year of the mission, and thereafter at intervals small bodies of converts, accompanied sometimes by their wives and children, joined the exiles, until they reached, without calculating their little ones, the number of 101. Of these, 83 were men. Amongst the women, 11 were of the Koresh, and 7 belonged to other tribes. 
33 of the men and 8 women, including Othman and his wife Rokeya the daughter of Mahomet, again returned to Mecca, and eventually emigrated to Medina. The rest of the refugees remained in Abyssinia for several years, and did not rejoin Mahomet until his expedition to Kibar, in the seventh year of the Hejira. Although Mahomet himself was not yet forced to quit his native city, he was nevertheless exposed to indignity and insult, while the threatening attitude of his adversaries gave ground for apprehension and anxiety. If, indeed, it had not been for the influence and steadfast protection of Abu Talib, it is clear that the hostile intentions of the Quraysh would have imperiled the liberty, perhaps the life, of Mahomet. A body of elders, we are told, repaired to the aged chief, and said, this nephew of thine hath spoken opprobriously of our gods and our religion, and hath upbraided us as fools, and given out that our forefathers were all astray. Now, avenge us of our adversary, or, seeing that thou art in the same case with ourselves, leave him to us that we may take our satisfaction. But Abu Talib answered them softly and in courteous words, so they turned and went away. In process of time, as Mahomet would not change his attitude, they went again to Abu Talib in great exasperation, and, reminding him of their former demand that he would restrain his nephew from such offensive conduct, added. And now verily we cannot have patience any longer with his abuse of us, our ancestors, and our gods. Wherefore either do thou hold him back from us, or thyself take part with him that the matter may be decided between us. Having thus spoken, they departed. While it appeared grievous to Abu Talib to break with his people, and be at enmity with them, neither did it please him to desert and surrender his nephew. Thus being in straits, he sent for Mahomet, and having communicated the saying of the Korish, proceeded earnestly. Therefore, save thyself and me also, and cast not upon me a burden heavier than I can bear. Mahomet was startled and alarmed. He imagined that his uncle, finding himself unequal to the task, had resolved to abandon him. His high resolve did not fail him at this critical moment. If they brought the sun on my right hand, he said, and the moon on my left, to force me from my undertaking, verily I would not desist therefrom until the Lord made manifest my cause, or I should perish in the attempt. But the thought of desertion by his kind protector overcame him. He burst into tears, and turned to depart. The aged chief was moved too. Son of my brother, he cried, come back. And now depart in peace. And say whatsoever thou wilt. For, by the lord of the Kaaba, I will not, in any wise, give thee up forever.